So, um, So uh, I'm going back to the So, excuse me. We focus on a case where the issue of interpretation has to be confronted head on. In this case, we address the different conceptions of the theory of electrodynamics by um, uh, by Maxwell and one of his uh, and one of his uh, uh, successors, Hertz. This case concerned the separation of formalism. From, physics, uh, from physical content in the context of electromagnetism. <coughs> we argue that the issue of correspondence between formalism and physical content, or the lack thereof, had already arisen in electrodynamics before the revolution of quantum mechanics. So, um, we... Sorry. I'm, I'm getting... <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Sorry. So the move from mechanics to electromagnetism from a domain of physics where one could think of oneself, indeed feel oneself as start of the connecting machinery to a novel domain where intuition fails, posed the challenge. Maxwell's study of electromagnetism should be seen as emerging organically from Faraday's work, both experimentally and theoretically. In 1873, Maxwell concluded his magnum opus, a treatise on electricity and magnetism, emphasizing that it was critically important for the development of electromagnetism to construct a mental representation of the details of the action of the medium, whose existence had been assumed despite the difficulties in conceiving it. Maxwell believed that, he, uh, that the advancement of science depend on developing, developing exact ideas which facilitate both mental representation of the physical state and warm deductions of mathematical reasoning. So he adopted the formalism of Lagrange as well as that of Hamilton to apply the abstract dynamics of Thomson and Tate to electromagnetism. According to Maxwell, Lagrange and his followers considered only pure quantity represented by symbols devoid of concepts such as velocity, momentum, and energy. While appealing to this mathematic, uh, mathematical technique, Maxwell was keen to retranslate the principal equations of the method into language which may be intelligible without the use of symbols. Maxwell explicitly expressed the need for bidirectionality from physical content to physical reality and back. He specified his aim, namely to cultivate <coughs> dynamical ideas. So here what he says. We therefore avail ourselves of the labels of the mathematicians, and he meant Lagrange and Hamilton, and we translate the results from the language of the calculus into the language of dynamics, so that our words may call up mental image, not of some algebraic uh, process, but of some property of moving bodies. Evidently, for Maxwell, the theory was not just the formalism. The theory had to offer mental imagery of the physics it dealt with. Thus, in constructing the theory, Maxwell sought to combine a purely symbolic language with physical content. The expression Maxwell's theory, or to be precise, Maxwell's electrodynamics, does not merely refer to the equations. Rather, it refers to the equations together with a host of commitments, assumptions, derivations, and mental images. For Maxwell's, for Maxwell's symbolic relation by themselves are devoid of physical content. A proper theory, indeed, a viable theory, needs to have both. It must convey physical meaning with its formalism. So it is then not surprising that Maxwell sought a mathematical formulation of electromagnetic phenomena, which could capture by could be captured by mental imagery of a mechanical nature. 
So uh, he found, uh, Maxwell found, that the medium must be in a state of a mechanical stress. Maxwell's discussion of his attempts to specify this mechanical stress is most illuminating. He claimed that a mechanism may be conceived which produces the effects of the electromagnetic field. However, he openly acknowledged that such mechanically equivalent model cannot be unique and that in principle there are infinitely many such models of different degree of efficiency in producing the electromagnetic uh, phenomena. So uh, the precise mechanism at the micro level cannot be determined. The theory complete with mental imagery is unproven, but the set of equations holds. Here we see a clear separation between the valid formal structure and the unproven physical interpretation. The separation between formalism and physical content was well established in physics ever since the strong analogy between heat conduction and electricity that was discovered by Thomson, later, of course, uh, uh, Kelvin, in 1840, uh, which he did in 1842. Given a formal correspondence between two distinct physical domains, the problems are interchangeable, namely heat conduction and electricity, and so are the solutions. We know that in this view, <coughs> what is critical for the advancement of physics is the mathematical structure which the symbolic formulation of the laws exhibits and not the physical theory. Put differently, <coughs> formalism stands while the physical content may vary. To be sure, this was not how Maxwell treated electromagnetism, but this, but this was the approach taken by the subsequent generation. And so, to sum up, up to now, Maxwell introduced a new approach in electromagnetism <coughs> in which the formalism cast in the form of mathematical equations could be separated from the theory, even though this was not how Maxwell uh, understood this theory. Indeed, Hertz capitalized on this separation and began to work with formalism without being constrained by physical meaning. Thus, he treated electricity and magnetism interchangeably and reformulated the equations for the two sets of phenomena symmetrically. In 1884, Hertz embarked on a detailed and critical analysis of Maxwell's set of equations. This major undertaking, und undertaking preceded his famous tour de force, proving experimentally that electric waves exist. As Hertz noted, he attempted to demonstrate the truth of Maxwell's equation by starting from premises which are generally admitted in the opposing system of electromagnetics and by using propositions which are familiar to him. Hertz has sought to show the validity of Maxwell's set of equations even if one starts with the premises of opposing theories, perhaps alluding to the viewpoint of his mentor, Helmholtz. At stake then was the issue of derivation and the goal of constructing a bridge between the opposing views. Hertz was particularly sensitive to laboratory demands. His interests were theoretical, but also, and perhaps even more so, experimental, <coughs> much in line with Faraday's practice. He stated that his motivation was to make the magnetic and electrostatic, electrostatic systems change places, that they should be interchangeable. Hertz sought to establish, first theoretically, and then experimentally, that the laws governing electrostatic force and electromagnetic uh, induction are interchangeable. Thus, uh, sorry, here we can read. Um, thus, uh, in the laws of electro, uh, electric induction, we need only interchange um, words, interchange words, electric and magnetic, throughout in order to obtain the inductive actions in a magnetic circuits. Notes that Hertz formulated laws in which the forces are interchangeable, although they keep their identity as magnetic and electric. 
Against this background, Hertz remarked that the two forces, namely electric and magnetic, had usually been deduced in an asymmetrical manner, and given the goal of his paper, it is not surprising that Hertz was dissatisfied with the way Maxwell's equation had been derived. The distinct phenomena of electricity and magnetism are analogous, and the formalism ought to exhibit a, correspondent, a correspondence between them. Hence, the equation should be symmetrical in the sense that analogous <coughs> elements have to correspond and to be interchangeable. He proceeded, he, sorry, he proceeded to eliminate the asymmetry between the forces uh, the, and render them interchangeable, <coughs> interchangeable, interchangeable by purely formal mathematical means. The trick was to differentiate Maxwell's original equations with respect to time. As Hertz stated, the result of his mathematical work was, the, was that the electric and magnetic forces are now interchangeable. And he, uh, his aim, he aimed sorry, at the following symmetrical result. Magnetic, current, uh, magnetic currents act on each other according to the same laws as electric currents. Symmetry for Hertz was um, uh, Hertz embodied the notion of inter interchangeability, and Maxwell's equations were recast to exhibit this picture. In 1889, in an essay on light and electricity, Hertz revealed the extent to which Maxwell's set of equations impressed him. It is impossible to study this wonderful theory without feeling as if the mathematical equations had an independent life and intelligence of their own, as if they were wiser than ourselves, indeed wiser than their discoverer, as if they gave force more than he had put into them. Notice how Hertz shifted the admiration from the theory to the equations. This is the background to Hertz's celebrated view of Maxwell's theory. In 1892, Hertz reported in the theoretical part of the introduction to his electric waves that he wished to simplify, to simplify Maxwell's theory <coughs> as much as he could by stripping it of all physical conceptions which could be dispensed with without <coughs> affecting the account of the phenomena. And he famously concluded, and I'm sure many of you know of this uh, uh, quotation, to the question, what is Maxwell's theory? I know of no shorter or more definite answer than the following. Maxwell's theory is Maxwell's system of equations. Hertz stated his belief that the formalism of the equations is independent of the theory. He then proceeded to spell out the different interpretation given to the formalism, indicated that he didn't share the view that the difficulty was of a mathematical nature. And he cautioned the reader that scientific accuracy requires of us that we should in no wise confuse the simple and homely figures as it is presented to us by nature with the gay garment which we use to clothe it of our own free will we can make no choice uh, we can make no change whatever in the form of the one but the cut and color of the other we can choose as uh, we please hertz wished to strip from the theory everything which he called garments except the equations the theory with its interpretive baggage could and should be separated from its purely formal mathematical representation to conclude, Maxwell was committed to some version of realism in electrodynamics, but it was indeterminate. Indeed, he acknowledged that there were many, in fact, infinite mechanical possibilities that can represent correspondence between formalism and physical content in this domain of physics. Hertz, we argue, abandoned physical reality in the sense that the set of equations, namely the formalism, stands alone without the theory. By contrast, Maxwell insisted that the theory must include the mental image of the, uh, a mental image 
of the action of the medium and thereby physical interpretation. It is noteworthy that Hertz did not challenge Maxwell's theory, and this is critical. There was no, there was no crisis here. Rather, he modified the formalism without raising any objections to the theory as Maxwell had presented it. He sought to reformulate, um, to reformulate it to satisfy the principle of symmetry. And we recall that in 1905, Einstein launched his special theory of relativity on the basis of the maxwell hertz equations, which subsequently, in 1907, changed the, references to, the reference to a maxwell lorentz equation. We are persuaded that the problem of interpretation in quantum mechanics is not unique, for it had already arisen in classical physics. The essential difference between the case of electrodynamics and quantum mechanics is that in electrodynamics no crisis had occurred, whereas in the case of quantum mechanics the new formalism was constructed in response to the failure of the quantum theory as elaborated by Bohr and Zonofer. To be specific, Hertz accepted Maxwell's set of equations, but noticed a lack of symmetry in the treatment of the two forces, electricity and magnetism. He then proceeded to modify the equations <coughs> algebraically to make them symmetrical. In so doing, he undermined the original intention of Maxwell's to construct a mental representation of all the details uh, the medium's action, uh, of the medium's action. By contrast, Heisenberg, together with a few other physicists, discarded the quantum theory, complete with planetary images, and developed a novel formalism based solely on observable quantities. In the original quantum theory, an agreed interpretation emerged, similar to that in classical mechanics. But it then became amply clear that this interpretation led to insurmountable difficulties. The breakdown of the quantum theory was addressed by the creators of matrix mechanics who found it necessary to replace the quantum theory with a fundamentally different one. Matrix mechanics is different from previous physical theory in that the problem of interpretation is evident and recalcitrant. Thank you. Talk. Uh, just a question. Uh, the extent of Hertz, if I understand correctly, was to symmetrize Maxwell equations. Did he go up to proposing monopoles as long as the divergence of B would be different from zero as the divergence of E? No, I don't. Sorry, I uh, The divergence of the electric field, the Maxwell equations, yes. is different from zero because it's proportional to the charge, whereas the divergence of the magnetic field is zero because there are no monopoles, yeah. according to Maxwell and many others. Yeah. So did Earth go up to setting the source term different from zero in the divergence of B? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, 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 I don't know, he did, yes, so, so he, seemed to, uh, he made the, the set of equations, the Maxwell original set of equations, symmetrical. So it means that he proposed monopole. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, my question is a little a uh, bit related to this uh, because in Maxwell's original formulation of his equations, uh, there was no place for discrete electrified particles. Yes. The concept of an electron was very foreign. So Maxwell had didn't really believe in it and so forth. And as far as I know, uh, these particles didn't appear in Hertz's equations. So my question is, when did they turn up? I mean, <coughs> was it only with Lorentz and, and Lama in the 1890s, or when did the electron become part of the Maxwell equation, so to speak? I think it's already in the relativity theory, in the original, in the original paper of the relativity theory, you, you have the electron already. Yes, of course. So, but Einstein didn't call his theory, of course, uh, the theory of the electron, but in fact, 
this you see it already in Abraham and Gusha and the other physicists uh, addressing the issue as the theory of the electron yeah. at the turn of the century. But yes. it's it's it certainly is earlier. I mean, mm -hmm. could Lorentz's reformulation but they was on. Uh, he didn't call it an electron, but he called it an ion. But it yeah. was a yeah. electric quark yeah. particle. And Joseph Lama in the 1890s had also the Eight. same. Three yeah. relativity ideas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's the late 1890s, okay. I guess. So yeah. at the, just about the turn of the century, they introduced a particle, into okay. the, a charge particle. Yeah. Is that later? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Just to follow up on, the, on what Helge said, I think we do have a case of like an interpretational debate here. Both in the case of Lorentz, you know, is it necessary to introduce um, point charges to account for the phenomena, which of course leaves the Maxwell equations totally intact, um, but you know, changes the physics considerably. And then after Einstein in the discussions about the ether, right? Do we need an ether to um, 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 explain electrodynamics? And I think, you know, ex exactly, you know, for example, what then Lorenz says about the necessity of the ether is a beautiful mm -hmm. example of an interpretation debate, right? Yeah. Because nobody mm -hmm. disagreed about the theory, right? They disagreed about the physical substratum for the theory, what it took to understand electrodynamics. Yeah. So I think we have a very nice case there of, 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 mm -hmm. of an interpretation mm -hmm. debate. Of course, it eventually mm -hmm. sort of... Um, um, did not quite get as, 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 as epic as the quantum physics <laughs> one. But in a way, right, you can say there's still people who like, you know, and Einstein himself later said that, you know, mm. we could mm. call the um, um, manifold of general yes. relativity the ether, right? So mm. in a way, that's also still an open question. Right? Mm. Mm. Right, thank you. I, I think mm. this just uh, this proved true. the case, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So my, the claim that uh, we have the problem earlier mm. Mm. in quantum mm. mechanics. Mm. Uh, mm. So, and just to remind you that um, the, the first sentence in the uh, Special Relativity of 1905 concerns the separation between the theory and the formalism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's right there. Mm -hmm. you know. Sorry to cut the debate short for, um, you know, for the sake of uh, keeping to the schedule we need to move on and maybe just uh, other questions that uh, are there can be discussed uh, during the break. Um, so our second speaker. Yeah,